Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. Today, I wanna to continue on our theme of praise and I wanna discuss another topic that's important before we go into this series of the Holy Spirit. And last week, I discussed uh, King Jehoshaphat and how he handled that overwhelming, scary moment with a large army coming at him. And he discovered that if he, if he humbles himself, you know, after he sees that scary moment, he, he turns to God in prayer. He humbles himself and asks God for his help. And God instructed him, I have this battle. Let me fight for you. And King Jehoshaphat and the people began to praise God while they watched uh, before God even started fighting, and then they watched God take care of the enemy. And so we learned that this week, uh, last week, and this week, um, I want to talk about not just the, the big battles and not just the ones that hit close to home in your life, but there's another kind of battle, and it's the battle that goes on in your thought life. And I want us to be prepared to handle that and to fight those thoughts. Um, and, of course, the battle still belongs to God in your thought life, too. And you have to lean in on God for that. But battles aren't just what we're seeing going on globally in our world where we can be overwhelmed and despaired of what's happening. Maybe uh, something has hit your home, maybe a tragedy, a loss, uh, someone who's sick, or maybe there's some division in your home or whatever it may be. That's personal life. But we're talking about internal life here. And God cares about that as well. Now, before we continue... We need to understand a foundation that even as Christians, even though we're saved, we still have renovation that's taking place in our hearts and minds. So, yes, uh, we are saved. If, like, let's say this is your life before Christ. And Christ is over here, and there's a circle, okay? Before Christ, you were over here. But when you believed in Jesus, the Bible says he sanctified you, or, or other, also known as set apart as holy. And so you stand saved and justified in Christ, and that's your new position. Your new position and the way God sees you is you're saved. Okay, you've been set apart. Now, inside of this place of being set apart from the world and being saved and forgiven, now we grow, and we call that sanctification. Okay, so you've been sanctified, set apart, but sanctification is an ongoing process of growth. In this life in Christ, while we haven't received perfection, at least we are saved, okay? But God begins to renovate our hearts and minds from old patterns, old ways of living. And while we're in this position with Christ that is saved and justified, we still are going to be tempted by sin. So how do you deal with that? We're going to be struggling with thoughts of anxiety and fears. How do you deal with that? So that's where we're at. So don't feel bad if you feel like a mess still, Okay, uh, don't feel bad if you still got work to do. We all have work to do. And we're all being renovated and worked on by God. Now, we do need to be intentional about walking with Christ and following his patterns, his ways of living to mature and be sanctified and live that life. So in theology and in Bible college, we called it progressive sanctification. Okay, if you had positional sanctification is you're saved, progressive is you keep growing in that salvation. You keep understanding and living more and more for Christ. So in that journey, guess what? We, our thought life can go through some battles. And so today I want to bring us to that. And uh, let me read Romans 12, 2, but I also want to read Romans 12, 1. I neglected to put that on the screen for us. It says this, Romans 12, 1, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies, in other words, to give your life to God, because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Paul says, give your whole life, because of all that Jesus has done for you, give your whole life. That would include your thought life. And then he says this in verse 2. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. So this is that, that sanctification life, living a holy life. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. 
Interesting. So your mind and your thoughts are important in your ongoing growth in your new relationship with Christ. Then you will learn how you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Now, how do we know what God's will is? Through the Bible. We learn what his plans are through his word, but then he can specify them as we move forward. But we find out who we are in Christ through his word, by following Jesus, by looking at Christ, looking at the truths of scripture. And it's important that we understand that the Bible talks about our minds and thoughts more than we maybe even realize. And the reason why is because your thought life is an important part of your whole being and worship to God. We can worship God even in our thoughts and our hearts. Let's go to the Old Testament again, and you'll see this verse on the screen, Psalm 19, 14. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart. Let me stop for a moment. Whenever you read anything about the heart and the mind in the Bible, they're really interconnected. Okay, what goes on in our hearts goes on in our minds. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart or mind be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Do you see there that, that God cares about your physical words that are coming out, but he really also cares about your heart and your mind as well. Psalm 139.2, the psalmist David said, You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. Psalm 139, the same chapter, verses later, 23 and 24. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. I love that. That's someone who's sanctified, who's saved, and they're wanting to grow. And they're saying, Lord, look at my heart, look at my thoughts and see if there's anything wrong with them, and lead me in the way everlasting. Now, that is our prayer today. That is, that is how I live. That's how we should live as Christians. And here's, here's the two takeaways from just the beginning of this, uh, these scriptures already. What we think often shapes what we believe. And what we believe often determines how we behave. This is why God cares about our thoughts. He cares about what we think of him. He cares about what we think of ourselves. Because what we think we can tend to believe and then what we believe is usually the conviction of how we live out our lives. That's why when God comes in, he doesn't want you to just have religion and duties and activities that make you look like a Christian. He wants you to be cleansed from the inside out, and so your thoughts and hearts worship him before you ever get to church. That's why we just sang that song. We don't want to follow religious ways and duties but not have a heart for God. We want to have a true heart for God. We, so, see, the thing is, religion doesn't have to be bad, but unfortunately mankind has made religion kind of bad because we do all the duties and all the activities that a Christian should do, but God knows inside of our hearts and minds, it's, it's wretched and needs some work. And sometimes we just do what we're supposed to do so that we appear that we're faithful to God. And meanwhile, God's like, I know your inner thoughts. I know your heart. I know your life. And so we're, we're challenged to be an authentic church. Amen? And Calvary, Calvary believes in being a real authentic church. And guess what? God helps you do that too. And so we evaluate our, our thoughts, not just our actions, because God cares about our thoughts. So there's this battlefield of the mind. There's a battlefield of the mind, and Paul goes into this in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. If you want to use your version of the Bible you have, you can turn to that, 2 Corinthians 10 in the New Testament. And we're going to be in verse 3 and 5. I'm going to read two translations, the New Living Translation. And also another one that my son uses for his Bible, it's the NIRV, New International Reader's Version. And uh, just listen to this battle that takes place when it comes to um, philosophy, arguments, and thoughts. It says this, we are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, 
to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. The NIRV says, I do live in the world, but I don't fight my battles the way the people of the world do. The weapons I fight with are not the weapons the world uses. In fact, it is just the opposite. My weapons have the power of God to destroy the camps of the enemy. I destroy every claim and every reason that keeps people from knowing God. I keep every thought under control in order to make it obey Christ. It's good. What we're reading here is spiritual warfare going on. And the context here is that Paul is dealing with false teachers and community that is trying to undermine his authority and leadership. And what he planted in this church in Corinthians, he's countering that. And he's saying, we fought all those false arguments and philosophies and thoughts and teachings with the truth of Christ, with the weapons of, of Christ. You guys remember our series in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6, we talked about the armor of God and the weapons that we have. That's, this is what Paul's talking about. He used the armor of God, okay, and the weapons we know is the word of God. And we also know the sword of the spirit, the word of God. But we also believe that prayer is a weapon. And Paul was using prayer, using the word, using the helmet of salvation and all the other uh, pieces of armor to battle against those who would come against him. And he is in this situation where he is actually, this is what he's going to do. He's saying that we are going to face these with the truth of Christ, with the word of God. And we want to save those people, and that's how much they're going to obey Christ. That even their thoughts are going to obey Christ. Because he didn't want to just change their outside and leave alone the inside. He didn't want to leave the, touch the inside and leave alone the outside. They fought spiritual warfare is spiritual, right? They fought with spiritual weapons. And so we have to fight in the spiritual realm with prayer and the word of God and our flesh sometimes has thoughts it shouldn't have. And sometimes the enemy can use people to put thoughts in our minds. And sometimes we're responsible for allowing things to be in our hearts and minds. And he says, take captive every thought. Now that is definitely being used in his context of going against people who are trying to stop his church from believing in Jesus Christ. But there's a broader application to this that we endure a, a, a life in Christ, but we still are not perfect. And so we have to counter those imperfect thoughts with the word of Christ. Are you following me? And so the broader application would be, let's take every thought, not just those who are coming against the teaching of Christ, but let's take every personal thought as well and make it obedient to Christ. So I, I titled the message, Capture Your Thoughts, and the, the reason being is we can capture our thoughts and make them obedient to Jesus Christ and his word. We can compare them to Christ. Here's some thoughts that we could have. Uh, there's thoughts of sin like lust and hate and greed. There's thoughts of bitterness, fear, or despair. And then there's those thoughts of the enemy, those lies. And sometimes even things that we have fallen for and we'll tell ourselves, such as, I'm not loved by God, or I'm a failure and I'm too messed up to be fixed by God. Or another lie is I'll never change. This is the way I'm always going to be. There's no way God would forgive me. Like, where does that come from? Because it's not in the Bible. It's either from the flesh or from the enemy, and either one, it's wrong. But we know that because we know the word. And so we have our spiritual weapon and we make them those thoughts. We stop them and remind them of the word of God so that they will obey. So our thoughts will change. And let me give you an example. I want to give you a practical example of maybe what I would do in a certain situation. And this is personal, <laughs> as you can imagine, because who knows my thoughts, right? Right. Oh, you know, I jumped ahead on you. 
there's a couple takeaways for you. This scripture, this is important. This scripture is telling us we're not helpless in our battles, in our mind. That we don't have to be captives of our sinful or anxious thoughts, but we can captive or we can capture them. Amen? Even our thoughts are to obey and submit to the lordship of Jesus Christ. So not just your life physically to serve, to give, to help people follow Jesus, to do what's right to your neighbor and love your neighbor, but even your thoughts should be submitted to the lordship. Jesus should be the lord of your heart and mind. And I think it's so cool that that's what Pastor Arya said today. Does, is he the king of our hearts? Do we follow his commands or are we doing whatever we want to do? Our thoughts should be obedient to Christ. Secondly, the truth of Christ helps us fight for our peace and purity of mind. The truth of Christ. Now this is interesting. Jesus died for us on the cross. He rose again. And we're going to learn in this series that he sent his Holy Spirit to dwell in us, to be with us forever to the end of the age. And we're learning here that our thought life has to be obedient to Christ. Just in case we start coming up with some false ideologies or philosophies or something crazy. Right? That means Jesus is even fighting for your thoughts. He's fighting for you in your heart and in your mind. And that's able to be done because the Holy Spirit lives in you. Now, if you want to study more of that, Romans 8, write that down. And Galatians 5, but I'm pretty sure we're going to get to that in our series. But get a head start. Romans 8, Galatians 5, 16 through the end of that chapter, you're going to read how the Holy Spirit is there to help you contend with the things of the flesh and to, be, to overpower the things of the flesh. So let me give you that example that I now have gotten you all built up to here. <laughs> that was my mistake. How do you take a sinful thought captive and make it obedient to Christ? Well, here's an example that I might do. God, and so, so it happened. That thought came into my mind. And now I begin to pray in my heart. Sometimes I'm talking out loud because I might be on a walk or I might be driving. You know, it doesn't matter. God, I'm not sure why that popped into my head. Or, God, I am responsible for that thought because I've been dwelling on it. Or I filled my mind with things I shouldn't have. The hurtful thought towards that person is not of you. It's not acceptable to you. My bitterness, offense, and hurt is something that I need to deal with. I give this offense to you right now. Your word says to bear with each other's faults, to forgive and be patient with one another. I choose to let it go. Even Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. I choose to not let it occupy and form a stronghold in my heart or a fortress. I don't want that bitterness to build in my heart and mind. I choose to let it go. I remember all the times you have been merciful to me, and I didn't deserve it. So I show mercy to this person. I ask that you minister to that person's heart in whatever way is needed. I don't know what they're going through, and I pray there will be peace between us moving forward. Amen. Wow. Satan seeks to divide us. Seeks to divide us even with our common man, whether they're Christian or not. God seeks to unite us. We could choose what we do with that thought in that moment. Let that offense take root and, and build in our hearts and minds and occupy a space that it shouldn't and let it even grow and become a fortress that now we have to destroy later with even greater intervention and intercession and prayer or we let it go before it begins to build a foundation. This is an example 
And you can use that for any kind of sinful thought. This one was more of like an anger and a bitterness towards someone. That's not of, not of God. He doesn't want us to have that. And so you can apply that to many thoughts. But in our world right now, there's been a lot of fear. There's been a lot of anxiety and a lot of worries and concerns. And there's a scripture that is my go-to for discipling people and helping them get through those moments. And it's my own scripture as well that God has shown me to use. So go to Philippians chapter 4. And we're going to be in this for a little bit here for the rest of our message. Philippians chapter 4. And we're going to read uh, 6 and 7, then we'll go into 8 and 9. I will say, though, that Philippians 4.4 4 is one of those scriptures that convicts me, and, and I don't like it because it convicts me so much. Philippians 4.4 4 says, Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Well, that's easier said than done, Brother Paul, the Apostle Paul. But I do know this, there's no way I can be full of joy if I'm not full of Christ. And because I am no longer who I used to be and I'm now saved and standing in Christ, I have full access of Jesus Christ in my life. It's up to me how full I am of Christ. That sounds like a sermon series maybe one day. I'm full of it. Full of Jesus. Make sure we clear. See, we're all, we're recorded now, so everything can be edited, and I can be smeared in the public for that. I'm full of Jesus, and what's cool is in our Holy Spirit series, we're going to talk about how we're full of the Holy Spirit, and that's who comes out, and it's gonna be it's gonna be great. So look at this verse, uh, verse six. Don't worry about anything. Well, really? Like this is also another one I struggle with. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. And then the result is this. Then you will experience God's peace. This is his supernatural peace, just so you know. It's not something that you can conjure up. Okay, this is from God. Which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Notice that your hearts and minds that guards you all day. Do you know how many bad thoughts never got in because the supernatural power and peace of Christ, the Spirit of God has already guarded you and protected you? We have no idea. We have no idea how many things try to get into our head, but we wear the helmet of salvation. It never got in. Yes. Praise the Lord. And it's important that we understand when Paul uses words like the word in, he wanted us to learn from that because the last line says, as you live in Christ Jesus. Not as you live reading every article, every news report, As you live in that for hours, guess what's going to happen? You're not going to have peace. As you live in Christ, you have the supernatural peace. So there's actually a progression here. He says, take your worry to God in prayer. Okay, then focus on thanking God for all he has done or all he does. Then you experience God's peace. Does that sound like last week's message or what? King Jehoshaphat had to immediately give his fear to God and pray. He asked God for help because he says, I can't do this on my own. God says, I will fight for you. He speaks to him through a supernatural word, through a person in the congregation or in the community. And they praise God through the battle because he was already winning for them. He was going to do that. They believed he was going to win. What we do is... When that anxious thought comes in, we stop and we go, whoa, where did this thing come from? Why am I afraid? Why am I worried about tomorrow? Why am I worried about this thing that may not even happen? I give it to you, God, and I let it go. Take this worry and concern, and I give it to you, and then you begin to remember all the good that God has done for you, and you thank him. 
you are shifting your mind, your mindset, and your heart to dwell on the faithfulness and goodness of God in that moment. And it's when you do that, when you don't allow this anxious thought to occupy your heart and mind and take root or build a fortress in your heart and mind, which would later be a stronghold that, that we will have to break down. And that's it's fine. Some people may have done that. And so we got to break down that stronghold with, with theology and scripture and prayer and the Holy Spirit. And a lot of times it happens at the altar here. It happens in, in discipleship meetings. And it happens in prayer nights. It happens by yourself with God. You can let it all go and let God destroy that stronghold in your heart and mind. But the progress here is don't worry. Take your worry to God in prayer. Thank God for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace. Now, there's a scripture that came to my heart this week about God inhabits the praises of his people. It's a powerful scripture. It's in the Old Testament. I think sometimes we kind of, like when I was a kid, I used to think like, okay, so like invisibly, is he like riding on our words or something? Like, is that what that means? Like he's inside my words and my breath? It's kind of weird, right? Like as a kid, you're trying to understand that. Well, God inhabits us. Amen? Again, we'll learn through the Holy Spirit series that we are his temple where the spirit dwells. So God already inhabits his people. What happens is when we praise him, we realize his presence is near. He's been there the entire time you've been afraid. He's there whenever you're worried. He's there whenever you're anxious. If you begin to praise, he will inhabit those praises. He, his presence will be manifested. His presence will be there with you. That's how he inhabits the praises of his people. In other words, the spirit of God reminds you that God is there. Just praise him. I am here. Just praise me. Give him thanks. Oh, that is so good. Thank you, God, for that word. Philippians 4, 8 through 9. It's one thing to guard against anxious thoughts, but what if we deposit good thoughts Sounds like a plan, right? Well, that's what Paul says in verse 8. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. I love that. He even says this, keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me. So they've been discipled by Paul. They've been taught everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. I love that. That's a discipleship scripture. And that reminds me that we need people to help us, to remind us too of of how we should think and behave. And I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to have someone in your life that you can pour into. Just one person this year. Just one person that you can write and say, hey, remember what, I, what we talked about. Remember what I taught you. Remember what we learned together. Let's follow the word of God. Let's follow that scripture. And I'm praying for you. See, there's peace as well in the community of believers, especially when we're there for each other. This scripture teaches a few takeaways here. We need to be mindful of what we deposit in our hearts and minds. It matters what we see, what we watch, what we listen to, and what we take in. It matters. What we store in our hearts matters. If we store God's word and truth in our hearts, then they will dominate our thoughts. And you know what else I like to do? I like to store God's word in my heart so that When those thoughts come, whether they're sinful or anxious, immediately I cut them down with the truth of Jesus Christ. It could be a sinful thought, and you say, that is not who I am. I am a child of God. I am a holy child of God. And I choose not to follow that thought. You're inadequate. You're not going to be able to do this. You're a failure. That is not true. 
I'm a co-heir with Christ. I have inherited an everlasting inheritance that will never fade or be destroyed. I'm a more than a conqueror. I'm, I'm a conqueror because of Christ. It's not me, but Christ in me, Scripture says. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. That's why we need to know Scripture. Because we start cutting down all those lies. Whether it's from the flesh and our renovated self that's not done yet, or whether it's from the enemy, or even if it's from someone else. So let me wrap up this message with just a, really a few takeaways. And if you want to see my notes, you can go to our website, calvarydover.org forward slash grow, and you can see our notes from today. But here's a really simple thing that brings me comfort. God cares if your thoughts are causing you to suffer or causing you to sin. And he meets you in your thoughts. <laughs> He's there. He inhabits the praises of his people. His spirit is there. His spirit will encourage you when you're feeling afraid and, and he'll convict you when, when you need to be convicted. You know what that means? He's there. And he cares. He cares. So he does that to help you. It matters to God, our thought life. Secondly, surrender sinful thoughts to the truth of God's word. Remember who you are in Christ. You do not let, have to let that thought just go on and on in your head. That is not of you. Remember who you are in Christ. You have the Spirit of God in you. Be controlled by the Spirit, not the flesh, Romans 8 teaches. So don't let it take reign in your life. Let Jesus reign. Thirdly, surrender anxious thoughts to God in prayer and thanksgiving. You've heard me say that. I'm telling you, in my life, I've had so many moments where I told you this last week. There's been times where I caught myself daydreaming for 20 minutes, worried about something happening that never happened. You don't have to live that way. There's freedom in Jesus Christ. Lastly, remember that God occupies your life through the Holy Spirit, and he is the source of everlasting courage, which we need. We need that confidence to battle that anxiety. He is our peace and he is our joy. That is what we have access to through Jesus Christ. It does take faith to believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. It also takes faith to walk out every day knowing that's who you have inside of you. It takes that faith. It takes you to be consciously aware and the Holy Spirit, we have, emo there's something called emotional intelligence. I also I look at the spiritual life and I say we have spiritual intelligence, spiritual awareness. The Holy Spirit will make you aware of a thought and you have a choice. Become a captive or capture your thoughts and make them obedient to Christ. Sounds like a good place to stop. Amen. And the cool thing is you get to overcome those thoughts that are wrong because of the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of you. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. That was a scripture on my heart as I prepared this message. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Would you close your eyes, bow your heads for a moment? Because in this room, in our homes, some of us have been in prisons of fear and anxiety. Maybe prisons of, of sinful thoughts that need to go. And your salvation has set you free from being in those prisons. You know what happens? Some of us, some of us, we don't realize the prison's unlocked. We just stay in there. Push that gate open. Push that door open. You are set free in Jesus Christ. What I'm saying is, is walk by faith a free life. The power of God in you is greater than any sin greater than any thought. Does it mean you're perfect? No, we learned that. Does it mean you'll have to fight? Yes, you will have to be aware and you have to be careful of your thoughts. But you have the power of the Holy Spirit to help you. God cares so much about your internal life that he came to dwell inside of you to help you through that too. 
So today, if you need freedom, remember that he has set you free. By his stripes, you are healed. By his stripes, you are forgiven. Thank you, God. The word says, I'm speaking to you right now, the word of God. The word says you are a new creation in Christ. The old is gone, the new has come. Thank you, God. Lord, I pray that they would believe they are a new creation. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. The truth shall set you free. You are free indeed. God, rescue today those who are imprisoned by anxiety or any kind of thoughts that are not of you. Be so full in our lives, your presence so full, that you dominate our hearts, that your joy, your peace, your courage and confidence pushes out all of those fears, all of those struggles, all of those thoughts, God, heal the past that we keep thinking about. In the nine o'clock, there was, the word forgiveness came up in my heart when I was praying. Today, I'm going to say the same thing at 11. If you haven't forgiven, you have imprisoned yourself. Forgive. Forgive and let it go. You may never hear an apology. You may never see physical rest, reconciliation between you and that person, but forgive and let it go. Be free. Jesus taught us that. And when we don't forgive, we can't release the past. Or we can't release the offense for the future times we see those people in public. Forgive. Let it go. Jesus, we let go today. And we take who we are, the new creation, in you. Set us free from those fears and anxieties. Set us free because we are free indeed. We give them up to you. Thank you for your freedom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can we give God some glory and praise for what he's doing? Thank you, Lord.